Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Alex Wolf and Gavin Shaw here. And today begins the Knicks season. We are so excited. They have their opener tonight against the Celtics. And of course, now is the perfect time to come up with our, our final. Well, Gavin, why don't you introduce what we decided to come up with uh, calling this segment? We literally named it like three seconds before we started recording. And it's the best name ever. Confident or insecure? What are we confident in heading into opening night? What are we insecure in heading into opening night? R.J. Barrett, high on the confidence scale. The next defense, high on the confidence scale. Little worried about finishing. Little worried about Kemba Walker getting targeted on the other end. We'll get into all that right now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. I am Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. He is Gavin Shaw your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster. And this episode is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. And I tell you what, I always love me some sausage and egg McMuffins in the morning it is the best it, it's like tier one breakfast food and i'm not i'm not even gonna front uh all right gavin we so today's the day the next start playing real basketball again regular season uh i think as we're recording this the uh the nets have already lost their first game so things are off to a good start and the uh lakers i think are winning against the warriors right now i looked away a couple minutes ago so i'm not 100 percent certain um but that means that the first day is almost done as we're recording this. And as people are listening to this, the second day will be underway and we'll be just a few hours away from the Knicks taking the court for the first time this season. Uh, we decided that a good theme to go with here would be uh, concerns versus how did I forget it already? It was confident versus insecure. Confident. Confident yeah. versus insecure. My God. I Well, yeah. See, we literally said that we came up with the name on the spot right before the show. And now people and will believe forgot. us and they'll be like, wow, it really was good. And they really did come up with it just now. And now we're doing this on YouTube. So in the interest of not having to chop this video up, I'm just going to keep rolling through it. So we're, <laughs> we're going to go with confident versus insecure now. Uh, do you want to take the first confidence? What's your what's your first confidence for this next season? Yeah, so my my first confidence, and this, is, this one is centered around opening night, but confidence in general is that RJ Barrett is going to have a big opening game. Did a little research. He has had... A generally impeccable career against the Boston Celtics in six career games. He's averaged 21.2 points, 6.8 rebounds, 2.5 assists while shooting 45.5% from the field. And get this, 57.7% from three on 4.3 attempts per game. So RJ has has kicked some Celtic ass um, in, his, uh, in his first two years. And I think... This will sort of be a forever measuring stick for him throughout his career. How does he do against Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown? I'm sure everyone down the road, I think, honestly, it could be the 4-5 matchup in the East this year. It would really kill for a Knicks Celtics playoff series. And I'm I'm personally really, really rooting for that because to me, that would be the ultimate sort of like prove it ground for R.J. Barrett. Like, I, I don't think he's going to um, outplay Jason Tatum. I don't even think he's going to cancel Jason Tatum out. But can he make the leap to being close to a Jalen Brown level? I mean, that would that would put him in at all star status. That's exactly what Jalen Brown was a year ago. So I, I think um, the other thing to note here is without Reggie Bullock, I mean, he will probably be the guy tasked with guarding Jason Tatum early in this game, um, depending on if the Celtics come out with two bigs or if they try to play Tatum at power forward. I generally think that they're going to try to go two bigs. So that'll certainly be an interesting first night matchup for RJ to see if he can kind of fill Reggie Bullock's shoes and and if that role is not too much for him to produce on both ends. Yeah, and I, I think you're right to be confident about it. I mean, to your point, he's already, he's beaten up on the Celtics before so far in his career. And I think that there's no reason to believe he's not going to continue that. I think he's built for the big stage. You know, we've learned this about RJ over his first couple of years in the league is that 
you know, he doesn't shy away from the big moment. He doesn't shy away from the big matchup, you know, with the division teams, whatever. I, I, other than maybe the Sixers, who <laughs> they won't be a problem this year because they don't have Ben Simmons anymore to be like super RJ Barrett and <laughs> lock him down anymore. Um, or at least it doesn't seem like they're going to have Ben Simmons to do that this year. Uh, you know, he's, he's been pretty good against division teams, I think, and especially the Celtics. I'm really intrigued to see how he does against Tatum. If the preseason matchup with Bradley Beal was any indication, I think he should be okay. And the, the big thing is, is that obviously Tatum is like a much bigger, stronger version of a player like Beal. Um, probably not quite as, as overall talented as a scorer. Maybe, eh, maybe you could say they're just a little different, you know, they play a little differently, but I don't think that that uh, the moving up a size in matchup, like, I mean, Tatum kind of plays like the four now by and large um, positionally. So, you know, there's, it, that sort of means that RJ is like moving up a position to guard him, but I don't think there's any issues there. Like RJ's RJ's big. He's, he's been built like a grown man ever since his rookie year. And I really don't think that he's going to have too many issues guarding Tatum or, or uh, keeping in front of him or, or, all in all, just, I mean, you can only do what you can against some of the best guys in the league. I think it'll do enough to bother Tatum that, like, if you can get Tatum to shoot, like, 33% over the course of a game, even if he ends up, you know, via free throws and everything else, still hitting around, like, 20 points or something like that, it, that's a win because you're he's taking shots and he's only hitting 33% of them. So if he's taking the most of the shots for the other team, that means that many less shots for everybody else. And ultimately, you end up affecting their offense for the poor. So I, uh, I like that. I like that one. And you know, I, I, well, so if we want to expand on this just a little bit, who, who is the guy after Tatum in this opening game that you're like second most excited to see RJ against this year? Jim As, yeah, really? So both yeah. of them on the Celtics. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you just said in the opening game. No, no, no. Like, like overall, like oh, who's overall. the next guy that you're sort of like circling after Tatum. In this oh, first that's game? a good question. Um, I would like to see how he does. I don't know if he'll guard James Harden necessarily, but that's an that's an interesting one to me because he's so he's so cagey. Like it's not even like I think that's I mean that's that's the ultimate challenge in the NBA right now. Like it's not just that you have all these elite wings; it's that they all do like such distinctly different things. Like you can have certain strengths on defense that match up really well with one of these guys, but those strengths that apply to Tatum, I mean, might get you torched against Harden. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was going to give my own answer, but literally my answer was Harden as well. I, I think it's Harden. Yeah. Like, I'm really intrigued to see how he does because we've seen some other guys on the Knicks, <laughs> Frank Nilekina, uh, do really good against Harden previously in the past. And I think Bullock drew that assignment last year, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, in some of the Knicks-Nets games. We've also seen RJ D up. Kyrie pretty well in his rookie year. Um, although it, literally his his second game ever in his NBA career, he did a really admirable job on Kyrie Irving. And you know, everybody remembers that Kyrie hit that game winner in that game, um, the the second game of the 1920 season. And, and you know, you just remember that that was like RJ's like welcome to the NBA moment and Kyrie's like first big moment in a Nets uniform, whatever. But what people forget is that RJ played really good defense on him for like a whole quarter prior to that. Um, so he's, he's shown the ability to guard that, that level of offensive player for a while now, but it'll be cool to see if Tibbs, you know, lets him kind of put his money where his mouth is, where RJ said, like, I want to be that new Reggie Bullock guy. It'd be cool to see if Tibbs entrusts him with a guy as, as big and bad as James Harden, uh, early in the season. And I think the Knicks do get the Nets somewhat early on, uh, during the season here. So that, that'll be intriguing to see. Uh, but real quick, I just wanted to let everybody know. This episode of Locked on Knicks is brought to you by McDonald's, who have been proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect, a place where classmates can meet up for study group, knowing that they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team or the away team can come to recharge. And it's the place you always look forward to stopping at on a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. Uh, I can tell you guys that the one that resonates with me is the the after sports one. Uh, I, I always used to play like rec league baseball in middle school and stuff. And my like tradition was my mom would always take me to McDonald's after the game and I would get like 
back in the day they used to have mozzarella sticks and they were bomb and so i would get mozzarella sticks and like maybe some chicken nuggets or something uh and like like a sprite or something like that uh i was a huge coke guy even though everybody everybody loves mcdonald's coke i like it better as an adult but yeah that's i mean that's i i could definitely uh uh you know say that say that, that resonates with me so i'm gonna straight up read right off the ad copy here and it says that I can either just say I'm loving it or I can sing my own version of the bada ba 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 I'm loving it. Gavin, should I try singing? Do you think I have the Justin Timberlake in me to do that? I, I, have, I have a lot of faith in you. I'm, I'm, I'm confident. Right. I'm not insecure. All right. I'm going to do ba 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 I'm loving it. All right. That's a lot. And... <laughs> All right. And with that, we're, we're back into Locked on Knicks. Uh, so I'm going to – I'll hop into my um, – Let's just, uh, should I do negative or positive first? Yeah, no, no, let's, let's keep it confident for now. We'll, we'll, we'll keep we'll it confident. Negative. Yeah. All right, all right. We'll save off on our insecurities, just like real life. We'll push them down, pretend they don't <laughs> exist, and uh, and keep focusing on the positives here. So we'll go with the, with my confidence. Uh, my confidence for this season is that the defense is going to be fine once they have a full rotation of Mitchell Robinson's Nerlens Noel and Taj Gibson at center. And obviously that's TBD. That's a work in progress. It seems like Noel is not going to make the first game. Mitch is still working his way back into shape, uh, which will surely take, you know, at least a week or so. And Taj, you know, is still on HGH or whatever. So he's doing fine. He's totally good. His legs are great. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, you know, I think the reason for this is that the more I've been thinking about it, you know, Kemba Walker, yeah, he's been getting burned some in preseason. You know, we saw what Raul Neto did to him, what Dinwiddie did to him the other night um, with the Wizards. I think that was the most that that final preseason game was the biggest sort of like wake up call. I don't, I don't even know if you can call it that about uh, about Kemba's defense. You know, like we kind of knew already that he struggles as a defender because he's like six foot tall on his best day in, you know, very tall sneakers. And, you know, he's he doesn't have a particularly long wingspan. He tries hard on defense, but he's getting older now, too. And, you know, there's only so much you can do against much larger guys at the same position. So we knew that was going to happen, but, you know, I I think there are going to be some days where it's even worse. And maybe it was just apathy on his part, thanks to it being the final preseason game. Uh, Because he did definitely, I think in the first game, when he seemed a little more charged up and just ready to be out there again, you know, and and be out there in a Knicks uniform for the first time, I thought he was a little more active, like trying to strip the ball and, and getting in passing lanes and stuff than he was in that final game. But either way, how much worse is it than what Alfred Baton was doing last year? I mean, not much. And you still have Derrick Rose backing him up, just like you had Derrick Rose backing up Alfred Baton. And Derrick Rose, like going back to last year, has been playing really good defense as well. With Fournier, too, you know, it's like a lot has been made of the, the drop-off from, uh, you know, going from Reggie Bullock at that spot last year to now having Evan Fournier in the starting lineup and presumably soaking up big minutes in like the 30 plus you know maybe even like 32 33 minute per game category and i that's another like i just i think that fournier tries hard enough on defense and does enough that the Knicks scheme should be fine because they're really they're built around this scheme of tibbs is that it, where he wants to funnel everybody into the middle to have to deal with mitch and noel and taj and we even saw it in that first game with whatever we want to call him, 80% Mitch, you know, whatever percentage you want to say Mitch looked like he was the other night. We we got to see it right there that teams are still really afraid of him. You know, they don't, they don't want anything to do with Mitch. They don't want to be in there, you know, uh, uh, trying to score on this guy that has averaged like his rookie year, like four blocks a game in like 20 minutes. Um, they know what he could do and his deterrence is huge. And, and that's going to be the biggest difference. So, if the biggest issue is just the guys can get around Kemba and Fournier sometimes, there's still a Mitchell Robinson in there. And there's still a Nerlens Noel who literally like does like the, almost like the rock and does like the just bring it uh, and tells people to come on the inside. Those of you that are on YouTube, you got to just see me do the the rock, just bring it hand. Um, that should incentivize people if they're not. It should, you know, uh, by the way, subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, we crossed a hundred YouTube subs in like a day and a half. So that's awesome. Uh, so thank you to everybody that subbed there. Uh, but definitely check out the YouTube if you haven't already. But anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> not to get too on self-promotion here. I think the defense is going to be fine. I'll, I'll just throw that to you to react at this point, Gavin. I, I think the Knicks are still, maybe they won't finish quite as high as they did last year, 
Uh, I, I think that the increased pace is going to make it so they probably don't finish as number one in just raw points per game this year, which had so much last year to do with the fact that they had that that really slow pace. Yeah. Um, but I think the defensive rating and all that stuff, all the advanced stats they they uh, checked the boxes on last year, they should be like roughly the same spot. Maybe they'll drop a spot or two, but I'm I'm really not too worried about it. Yeah, I think I think they go from being like a top four defense last year to like borderline top ten. But again, I think the offense is probably going to offset that. I think one underrated area is that. A lot of people have questioned if Julius Randle, I mean, as insane as his offensive leap was last year, you can make an argument that his defensive jump was was pretty close to the same. Like he he went from someone who's pretty indifferent on that end to someone who's pretty elite on that end. And I think, I mean, there were some advanced statistics that he was like one of the best defenders in the NBA. I think the eye test more so suggested that he was good and not incredible. Um, but there's no reason for him to fall off this year in that capacity, right? Like he should have way more energy. He's not going to be doing nearly the same amount of stuff offensively. And he gives you, I mean, just a really versatile piece, like a guy who showed last year, he can switch onto guards and hold his own. You have that with Mitchell Robinson as well, who can switch onto guards and at least on the perimeter, certainly hold his own chasing from behind can probably hold his own. Um, so you have two, you have, you, I think you have a real advantage at the four and five and flexibility there that a lot of teams don't have. And to your point, Alex, that, that can compensate for a little bit of weakness in the backcourt. And then you're just kind of counting on what we were talking about in terms of RJ Barrett making the leap on that end and becoming a Reggie Bullock level stopper, which I, I think he's probably a year or two or may, excuse me, a um, year or two away from, because that is just, it is a lot of know-how and how Reggie Bullock plays defense, but physically RJ is like arguably more equipped than Reggie. Like he's, he's stronger. I think he has like at least as quick feet um and he's he's a clearly a, a incredibly smart basketball player so I've, I have every confidence he'll get there i will quickly shoe in my insecurity so we can spend the entire third segment on your insecurities alex which is, is something i i do in life as well um but anywho um i think uh my mind was centered around defense so it's relevant i'm concerned at least in opening night sense about kemba walker and i think this game will be a really good litmus test for just how much of an issue that is because the celtics again with those two big wings jason tatum um Jalen Brown and presumably if they're going to play really big like some people think they are and start Robert Williams and Al Horford together as well like you're going to have like two bigs who can set some nasty screens and, and, and generate some some really clean switches onto a a walker or um depending on the matchup like obviously if you were screening between a wing and a big walker probably wouldn't be involved there but the Celtics over the years, I mean, under Brad Stevens, at least we'll see if it changes under um, Ime Udoka at all. We're, we're pretty predatory about going after those matchups. And I think you could see, like, at least in like key moment situations where Kemba ends up on one of those guys. And, and we'll see to the extent to which he can either hold his own or more likely Tibbs will try to, like, scram switch out of those matchups and have RJ come running over and, like, throw Kemba in another direction. So I think it'll be a good opening night test for what the Knicks will most likely not have to face on a consistent basis until the playoffs. But when the playoffs come, I mean, this is what we were just talking about with Prez. That will sort of be the ultimate question. Can Kemba hold up in those situations or are you going to have to go to Derek Rose? And, and the great news for the Knicks, which is what you just noted, is he is an incredible break in case emergency option. And while not being a fantastic defender in his own right, certainly more equipped to hold up physically than Kemba is. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's sort of like what Prez said the other day. Prez, even as you know, one of the biggest Kemba Walker fans I know, was like, he might not even be the best point guard on this roster. It might be Derrick Rose at this point. And yeah. that's fine. You know, if, if Rose ends up closing games, I mean, I think Kemba's is fine <laughs> with that. I don't think that he would be super offended if he didn't close every single game. He knows his limitations at this point in his career. Um, you know, and I don't think that he would, he would object to the extra rest or whatever, but yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's a valid concern for sure. Um, I don't know if I like, I, like I, my last point literally is just that I think that they're going to be okay. And I stand by that, but the, there is, I mean, the reason that I even have to say that is because there is very real doubts that they are going to be okay uh, with Kemba out there at the one. I, I guess my main thing is just like, kind of like what I said in the last point, which is how much worse could it really be than Alfred Payton? And yeah. and I, I think the answer is basically like not at all. So I, I guess the, the main concern there, though, is that Elf, after a certain point, you never expected him to be closing games, you know, so you never were like, oh, well, this is a huge issue because Elf is closing every game and he's costing them the game by being a, a sieve on defense. This time around, it's like, no, I mean, ideally, I think Kemba is the guy that you want closing games. Um, so if it could be a little bit of an issue if Tibbs is like, Tibbs does get stubborn with his rotations and he was even stubborn with Elf for a degree last year. Uh, with closing games with him 
And so if he gets stubborn with Kemba and it starts costing the Knicks games and Tibbs is just like, no, it's not a huge deal, then, yeah, that, that could potentially be an issue for them. Um, yeah. It, you know, I, I hope that it's not, but it's the possibility certainly exists there that it could be. Um, I guess we'll have to see. I, I will say the one thing is I think that he was just kind of in preseason mode towards the end of the preseason. And I think at least at first, I mean, obviously fatigue plays a factor, but um, I think at least at first this season, what we'll see from him is more akin to what we saw in that first preseason game, which is a guy who's like very excited, very active, get, trying to get those smart plays that guys his size have to go for, which is essentially if the ball goes into the post, run in there quick and try to use your small size to swipe that ball away from that big and, uh, you know, get get things going with a turnover and, and a transition opportunity or something. If he does enough of those, it'll mitigate whatever he, you know, gives up via being too small, basically, at least to my eye. Uh, but Gavin, unless you had anything to add to that, um, we're, we're getting a little worked up here over Kemba's defense. I think we maybe need to calm ourselves down a little bit or what do you think of, of that no, that, that was that i couldn't i can't do better than that uh do you want to know what makes lebron james king james it's sleep that's right sleep is his superpower calm the number one app for sleep and meditation has teamed with lebron james to help you activate the power of sleep lebron and calm know that your mind is like any other muscle in your body but you don't have to be a world champion to learn how to train it calm can help you train your brain so you sleep better reduce your stress and perform your best just like king james for LeBron, sleep is a critical part of his mental fitness routine. As he says, quote, getting good sleep and fine time to rest is one of the most valuable things I can do for my body and mind. From the sound of rain falling on leaves to bedtime, sleep stories, calm puts me to sleep within minutes, which means I wake up ready for any challenge. So if you head to calm.com slash lock on NBA for a limited time, you'll get 40% off a calm premium subscription. With calm, you have access to the nature scene LeBron loves, like rain on leaves, and so much more like sleep stories and meditations so you can be ready for any challenge that life throws your way. Again, for a limited time, our listeners can join LeBron in using Calm and get a 40% discount on a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash locked on NBA. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, and sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash locked on NBA. That's calm.com slash locked on NBA. And today's show is also brought to you by Sweat Block. And, you know, LeBron, it, today, his his hair wasn't looking too, uh, too robust up there. I saw a lot of sweat on him. Perhaps LeBron wants to use some sweat block always happy to take a shot at lebron's balding but let me tell you guys for a few weeks now we've been talking about sweat block these wipes that stop sweat for seven days it seems like people have been listening we have friends of locked on who have tried sweat block and love it and let me tell you about this story straight out of hollywood we have a producer who is working on the set of a marvel movie this oh this resonates with me maybe you've heard of it i don't know what movie it was but i'm sure that i've heard of it at least she was working 18-hour days for weeks in the Atlanta heat. She heard about Sweat Block, started trying it, and loves it. No more sweaty production days. She even reports that one of the A-list actors uses it, maybe the green one, uh, I'm not willing to confirm or deny if it's Hulk, to stay dry on the set and on the red carpet. And I can certainly relate to that. I think I've told you guys enough. I had my my story of going to a 100-degree wedding in 100-degree New... Actually, it was technically Pennsylvania heat uh, over the summer. And there was no AC the whole time, including the whole reception in a barn with a metal roof on it and only fans to cool us down. And my pits stayed astonishingly dry compared to the rest of my body, which was sweating like crazy. Uh, and, and I have sweat block to thank for that. So there you go. Locked on listeners and me. We we all love sweat block. And apparently some locked on listeners are Marvel producers. I, I want to learn how to meet these people. Anyway, you can stop ex excessive sweat for up to seven days per use with Sweat Block. It's doctor created and doctor recommended and comes with the dry shirt guarantee. If Sweat Block does not keep you dry, you get your money back. And it's not just for armpits. You can use it on your chest, your back, your feet, your hands. Use it anywhere, and I mean anywhere, <laughs> that sweats. If you or someone you care about is dealing with excessive sweat, you have to check out Sweat Block. Get it today for 20% off at sweatblock.com with promo code locked on or at Amazon and CVS. But I tell you what, I'm not sweating. Well, actually, no, that's a lie. This this final thing is the thing that I am sweating. So I need to put some sweat block on in between takes. Unfortunately, we're doing this all in one take. So I can't. We're, we're, we're doing this, you know, video now. So I, I got to keep things rolling. Uh, the big thing that I am worried about, that I'm insecure about with this team, Gavin, can this team get inside and finish well enough or will they strictly live and die by the three? 
And so I pulled up uh, B-Ball Index has been like my best friend this whole offseason. I just want to shout them out for like the millionth time. Uh, B-Ball, it's uh, the actual URL is bball-index.com. And they have so many great tools. You can you can subscribe there that, that for like their premium stuff like this one that I'm about to cite or they have a bunch of free tools there. But definitely check them out. Really smart guys there. I said before we started recording, they have like more brains in their pinky than I do in my whole body. Um, but I did the lineup creator tool, which they they offer, which gives you like percentile values for various different things, uh, depending on what personnel you put out there. And the big thing that I'm worried about is the finishing at the rim. Now, the the big thing, so getting to the rim, the Knicks starting lineup is actually awesome, uh, according to B-Ball Index. They are 99, as a total lineup, the, the lineup of Kemba Walker, Evan Fournier, RJ Barrett, Julius Randle, and the assumption is Mitchell Robinson. At getting to the rim, 99.3rd percentile in the NBA among lineups. I mean, that's that's insane. They're as good as any team at getting to the rim. The problem is, according to B-Ball Index, their total uh, percentile for finishing at the rim is the 35.4th percentile. And that is, uh, to break it down individually, Kemba Walker is in the 26.5th percentile. Evan Fournier is in the 20.5th percentile. RJ RJ and Julius, these numbers surprise me. Uh, RJ apparently, according to B-Ball Index, and, and you know this might be taking into account his... Um, I'd have to look further into their definitions of how they figure out these percentiles, but it might be looking into how many free throws get drawn and all that sort of thing and factoring that in against the lower field goal percentage. But RJ apparently is in the 61st percentile finishing at the rim. Julius is apparently in the 79.7th percentile. And Mitch, I think this is a little low based off the fact that he played some of last year, a little rusty and whatever. Uh, after the one injury, he is in the 61st percentile at finishing at the rim as well. But again, as a as a whole, 35.4th percentile in finishing at the rim. And like that bears out when you watch the team, right? Like Kemba, Kemba is, you know, some of his athletic gifts that allowed him to just speed by everybody early in his career have diminished a bit. And that has led to him, particularly last year, which is what these numbers are based off of, having a harder time finishing at the rim, even though that was sort of a strength for him early in his career. Fournier you know, I think for his career is is a little better um, than what he displayed last year as well. He had kind of a weird year too, but it's not like his number one forte. His number one forte is like pull-up shooting and, you know, three-point shooting, getting into the mid-range shooting there. Finishing isn't like his, his greatest strength. RJ and Julius, obviously, I mean, with RJ, it's a huge sticking point that we talk about all the time that he has to get better at. Julius, it's, he, he's, I don't want to say settled because it was a great shot for him last year, but he chose to shoot from the mid range more often than getting all the way to the rim last year. And Mitch obviously helps you a ton in the fact that he can catch anything within a zillion miles of there. But as far as actually, you know, if, if you have him with the ball in his hands and say, okay, get to the rim, he can't really do that. You know, he's relying on someone else, but he can at least finish there, but he, he's the center and he mostly does that at a dunker spot, which is different than say a guy breaking someone down off the dribble and getting in there and finishing. So I worry a little bit, you know, I, I, this is a, this is a problem that some NBA teams have fallen prey to, you know, it was something that for a number of years uh, was sort of a thing that Budenholzer was, was uh, criticized for ironically enough uh, that now we have a Tibbs coach team that we could have these same worries when Tibbs is apparently, you know, if you listen to all the detractors before he got hired, he's completely averse to threes. We'll never adapt and anything, you know, all that good stuff. But, you know, I, I think that there is a chance that this team is a little bit like like those Budenholzer teams and some of those other teams that relied so heavily on the three that once you get to the playoffs and things tighten up on the perimeter and right up next to the hoop, you know, things get a little more difficult. I guess the, the plus to this is that the Knicks have really talented mid-range scores in, you know, no matter what, even if RJ, if that skill doesn't really come around too much for him this year, I would say that three-fifths of the starting lineup in Kemba – Fournier and Julius are all above average mid-range shooters. So maybe this doesn't matter anyway, because scoring is scoring. And if you can get the points from somewhere at 40%, you know, then then cool. You know, I, I think that's that's pretty solid. And that that roughly evens out over the course of a whole game, uh, combined with the fact that threes are more than twos and everything else. Um, so Gavin, I'll throw it to you. Sorry, I've been talking for a minute. 
But how do you feel about the finishing this year around the rim? And and it, do you think that's one of the bigger weaknesses on the team? Um, I think on an individual basis it is. But if you look at the team comprehensively, like it won't ultimately end up being that big of a weakness because I think they're going to get far easier than average shots there. Like if we've seen anything this preseason, it, it's sort of the the multiplicative effect of having four guys who can uh, pass, shoot, and dribble. And I, I keep saying that over and over again, but to me, it's going to be the biggest theme of this entire year. You, you can stretch a defense to its seams when you when you have four players who shoot over forty percent who can all beat a closeout, right? Like that's like there's not really an answer for that defensively. You're going to be rushing out. You're, you're going to be in bad positions, and all these guys again are like not just like good to above average passers. They're very willing passers. And we saw so many possessions in the preseason that just ended with threes that where, where there wasn't a defender within a couple of feet of the guy. And granted, the Knicks mostly played very bad defenses this preseason. And, and it was the preseason, so they weren't playing as hard as they possibly could. Uh, the challenge against the Boston Celtics, like if the Celtics go out with a starting lineup of Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Robert Williams, Al Horford, even at an older age, that's one of the more defensively intimidating lineups in recent NBA history. So this will, this will be about as challenging as it gets. For the Knicks, and I still think they're going to make their dent. I still think they're going to have possessions where where the Celtics just don't rotate in time, and the Knicks end up with either a wide open dunk for Mitch or or forty eight ducking in for a layup. Like there's just there's a lot of improvisation to be had on this team, and a lot of room for that improvisation. So the long story is they have below average finishers, but those guys will be getting above average quality looks at the rim, and that will equate to roughly average finishing at the rim, maybe a little bit better than average, and. To your point, they're going to be very good in the mid-range and I think absolutely elite from three. So it won't really matter. Yeah, I, I hope that's the case. And you know what's nice is that we have these we have these insecurities that we brought up in here. Sure. And much does. like I'm sure much like I'm sure we wish in real life could be the case, <laughs> they're all unfounded. <laughs> like, or they could all be unfounded. Because <laughs> yeah. we, we were able to poke holes in them immediately. Maybe I we're need gonna to... do a Patreon episode on all of our real life ones at some point. Yeah, right. Yeah, we'll we'll launch a uh, just that we won't even call it a locked on Knicks Patreon. It'll just be Alex and Gavin's insecurities podcast. That's a good one. We'll just we'll just <laughs> I, go I, on and on. <laughs> I think you want to talk actually had a pretty good audience, but you want to talk about long episodes, man. That'll be like freaking three hour long pods. Once we, we a get a lot, a lot of Nets fans looking for ammunition against us. Yeah, exactly. That's is, but you know, the joke would be on them if it's a Patreon because we'd have their money <laughs> in that case. <laughs> anyway, all right. I I don't think I have too much more to add. Do you have any uh any yeah. last second Fuego takes before the the opener tonight? No, nah, just excited to see everyone play. Yeah, I am too. I'm excited to just see how things are going to shake out in a regular season format. I think the biggest thing I'm intrigued about and excited about going into this first game is just to see how Mitch looks after a weekend of probably endless running. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of a lot of Thera gunning for him, I bet, over the week. La- hey, they, they didn't pay for this show. Yeah, oh, right, right. yeah, he's that. gonna, you know, just use the calm app. He's gonna get a lot. He of needs money. to use the calm app. Yeah, but you know, I'll also get a Thera gun. They're a sponsor too. Anyway, all right. I think I think we can wrap this episode up. We've said so yeah. much this whole off season. Now we can finally start talking about what's really going to be happening. So, thank you all so much for listening. Again, we're on YouTube now. Uh, you could have been looking at our faces this whole time if you haven't been. Shame on you. Uh, so, you know, if you want to go on to YouTube, uh, find us on there. We're just locked on Knicks on YouTube. You can subscribe. You can turn off the not- turn on the notification bell so you can see when we, when we, uh, post a new episode and you can comment and tell us we're ugly, uh, just add to the in- future insecurities podcast. Um, you can, <laughs> you can do whatever you want there. You can leave some thumbs up also. That would be really helpful. Cause I think that helps in the algorithm or something. I don't know. I don't know Jack about YouTube. So we're figuring that out as we go. But anyway, you know, video, go do that. Or if you're still just going to listen on on your favorite podcast provider, thank you so much for always supporting us and and being here. We're really excited for for another New York Knicks season with you guys. And uh, it gets started tonight. So we'll end this episode. Next time we talk to you will be tomorrow morning. And we'll be talking about hopefully a big Knicks win over the Celtics. But no matter what, we're here for you guys five days a week, all season. So we'll talk to you soon. Peace out.